Hi, welcome back to Home Time. We're back in Mankato, Minnesota, where the Betsy Tasty Society is renovating the childhood home of author Maud Hart Lovelace, who did the Betsy Tasty children's books. Maud and her family lived here from about 1892 to 1906, and her main character, Betsy, lived in a similar house with her family during the first few books in the series. The Society bought the house in 2001 with hopes of turning it into a Maud Hart Lovelace museum of sorts, but it was in pretty bad shape. By then, several different owners and renters had passed through and done, I guess what you might call, ill-advised remodeling that covered up or even worse, destroyed a lot of the original character. In 2005, we joined forces with the Society and the construction management students at the University of Minnesota in Mankato to help make the exterior of the house look more like it did when Maude lived here, with circa 1890s windows and doors, new siding, and some wooden steps coming down from the front porch. Then on our last show, we moved inside to try to see how things might have been laid out originally. We opened up an archway that had been covered over, took out paneling, ceiling tiles, flooring, and kitchen cabinets. And in the process, we hoped to save a lot of the original plaster, but wasn't in great shape. And with virtually no insulation in the walls and some really bad structural issues, it just made sense to tear out all the remaining plaster and lath. That opened things up so we could properly resupport the arch we uncovered, beef up some ceiling joists that were sagging very badly, and replace some top plate material eaten away by moisture and rot. In the kitchen, we also took out a window and a shared wall with the basement stairs, both of which had been added sometime after the author's family left. And we put in a new window that we built on site to match the specs of the home's original windows. All the while, Betsy Tasty Society volunteers were looking for evidence of the home's past, taking pictures as the layers came off, and sifting through the debris to salvage any artifacts hidden behind the walls or above the ceilings. So everything's been pretty well documented. Well, the goal now is to get the house totally insulated before winter sets in for real and get all the walls covered. Stick around, see how it all turns out. No matter what the dream, GMC is proud to support home time in making it come true. GMC, we are professional grade. When banks compete for your mortgage, some offers really stand out. You can compare up to four customized offers at LendingTree and choose the one that's right for you. 1-800-555-TREE. When banks compete, you win. LendingTree.com. And by Johns Manville. Manufacturers of a complete line of formaldehyde-free fiberglass insulation. Johns Manville. Our focus is insulation. Right now, there's obviously been a ton of demolition at the Betsy House, but there's also been a lot of detective work to determine what this house was like when author Maud Hart Lovelace lived here. Probably the most interesting things that we've learned about the house is how it originally was built. Um, probably just one or two rooms and a lot of rooms were added after the fact. How the stairway, the original stairway would have been placed in the house is completely different than where it is now. But we're not trying to recreate that because Maude didn't live most of her years in the house when it was like that. Julie Schrader is executive director of the Betsy Tacy Society, which owns the house, and Dennis Weiss is the head remodeler. They know a lot more about the house now than they did a couple of months ago. Well, we learned uh, pretty much that it was added to a number of times. Uh, and each time we remove a layer of something, we find something else. Maybe the way the studs were laid out indicated that there was a window there. Uh, but as far as overall surprises, you know, I, I haven't found any too serious. Well, it seems like uh, everybody's thinking that probably these first two parlors were the original house. In fact, it was broken up into three rooms with a stairway right up the middle. But then the dining room, the kitchen back over here, and this back bedroom were added at a later point. In fact, this back bedroom was talked about in the very first Betsy Tacy book. And so consequently, all the remodeling is done to the era of when this bedroom was added. I think we're to the point where we're too the renovations that the Lovelace family made and the renovations were made at the period uh, when Maud actually lived here. So it's uh, reasonable to go back to that point and then stop. But for us to know how it changed from the time she was a baby and the first few years of her life is, is very interesting and we can reconstruct that on paper. Things are rolling along real good. Pretty much uh, it's ready for the installation crew and, and they're here now and I'm going to stay out of their way. That's why uh, they're the installation contractors. When we come in to prep a house, we normally uh, cover the windows, tape all the outlet boxes, and cover any vent holes or any holes, penetrations through the floor that uh, might lead to another area. 
We have to pull in a vac hose, a blow hose, a glue hose, fill the hopper up with material, put a nozzle on the end of the blow hose, and uh, we're just about ready to go. Well, we've used this system before, and it's great. It's the same from all the high-free insulation that we use in bats when we're stuffing those into a wall. If this stuff comes bagged loose, they just spray it in. What's great about it is it fills absolutely every little nook and cranny, as you'll see in just a minute. Well, the hopper is set up so that when you cut a bag open, there's some augers in there that kind of rotate the material, kind of mix it up so that when it comes through the hose, it gets conditioned, and then it comes right through the hose and blows out the end. They spray the insulation into all the cavities. It sticks to the side of the wall. Then a scrubber comes in and takes it down flush with the framing. So everything's totally filled in, right out even with the framing. Then the vacuum comes along, vacuums up everything that falls on the floor, takes that back out to the truck, and the whole process starts all over again. Now this is what I mean about getting in every nook and cranny. I mean, it fills in around that electrical wire 100%. Many times with a bat, it gets a little separated with a wire, or even down around a box like this, you can see it's just totally packed in down there. Now this material does have a little bit of glue mixed in with it. The nice thing here is when this dries, you don't have to worry about any sagging or any settling over time. Now there is a, a little bit of moisture that introduced, maybe 10% moisture, but they say it dries pretty quickly, so it usually isn't a problem putting on vapor barrier the same day you do the spraying. Well, Rick's got a density tester here. Density has everything to do with R value. The more the density, the higher the R value. What have, what have we got? An R15. R15? Okay. R15, not too bad for a 2x4 wall. I'll tell you, it's starting to feel a lot cozier in here already. Thanks so much for all the help this morning. Thanks, Dean. You appreciate it. The normal drying time is about the time it takes us to get through the house. Probably take two, two and a half hours. I've been doing this for 12 years and I think this is the best product on the market. It seals up everything completely as much as you could seal it up without, you know, overdoing it. This is going to give this house the best thermal value that it possibly could give it. Last time we were here, we were talking about the different ways to deal with trash that's generated on site during demolition. And we did end up throwing out a lot of plaster and lath, paneling, drywall, that kind of thing to get ready for the new walls in the house. But not everything that we took out ended up in that dumpster. We did end up taking up some red oak strip flooring to expose the pine floor underneath. And by all accounts, the oak floor was added long after the author, Maud Hart Lovelace, and her family moved out. And it appears that the one by six planks that it's been hiding is what they actually walked on when they lived here. The oak was nailed down pretty well and the first batch got a little chewed up during the initial demolition so it seemed better to go a little different direction with the rest. And that's where Joel Berglund took over. And we didn't catch him on camera but you can see by the pictures that Julie Schrader took, he went at it one nail at a time, one piece at a time, slowly and carefully removing all the oak strips and very carefully working his way throughout the first floor. He also removed all the nails and neatly stacked the flooring, which he brought over to a friend who's going to reuse it in their house. So that's kind of nice. And now that we have our floor height established and all the insulation is done, we are ready to start drywall. Now we're using a specifically designed gypsum panel that's going to be used with a veneer plaster finish, which we'll be putting on later. So typically we would use an inch and a quarter drywall screw, but since we've had to take off some plaster and lath, we've had to fur out a few of the walls in order to match the jams of the windows and doors. So instead, we're going to be using inch and 5 8 screws. Now these babies are a little bit longer, which means they'll be able to go through our gypsum panel, any furring that we have, and still bite into some really good framing. As far as installation goes, of course, it helps to have a lot of volunteers on hand, but there are a few tools that can make it go easier as well. There is, of course, the standard pencil, tape measure, and T-square, but just as helpful sometimes as having a speed square for marking outlets and switches, a compass for drawing round holes, and a chalk line for marking the longer cuts. Now, as far as the cutting goes, a razor knife, of course, is mandatory. But don't kid yourself. Don't think you can get through the job with just one blade. Make sure you get lots of extras. A sharp blade will make it go a lot easier during the heat of the drywall battle. I really like the ones that you can just push a button and change the blade. And this one here is pretty cool. Just push a button, and it holds the blades right in the handle. They've also got drywall saws, keyhole saws, or they've got power rotary tools. But those can get a little bit tricky to use, so they're not for everyone. And finally, we have these foot levers, which are really nice to get the panels nice and tight on the wall. A couple benches never hurt to get up high. And then it never hurts to have one of these panel lifters on site. Anyway, process is already underway at the house, and Julie said she's got a volunteer group of about 12 people, 12 and a half if I ever get there, and we'll help get those panels up. 
We still have a good crew of our regular volunteers that have been with us from the beginning. Uh, we're getting new volunteers every different phase of the project, so we're very excited to see the support. I think initially when you uh, volunteer, um, maybe some people feel overly enthusiastic. I'm kind of come in uh, tentatively, but once I'm here and once you start working, you're all into it 100%. And when you're done, you do feel great. So you know, I actually hang drywall for a living. I'd rather volunteer do other things because you get a little tired of it. But, uh, but I guess you do, do what you can do. It seems like people are having fun. Some of our professors require uh, us to volunteer on certain projects for part of our curriculum, so it uh, gives us a good opportunity to come down and go on the field and actually work alongside crews uh, in the real world, see how things are run and see how projects are managed. Uh, really in a project like this it's kind of tough to set anything but a daily goal and I think that is our goal today is to get the drywall up and hung and and uh, leave a clean start for the next crew to come in here and pick up where we left off. So. Well, we got a three-man crew from a local construction company in the front parlor, and things are moving along real good there. The volunteer crew in the back, they're moving right along as well. The home time crew is kind of stumbling, but uh, they're, <laughs> they're, they're getting it along pretty good. Yeah, a little bit slower than us, but we got here before they did, so they have a chance to catch up. I think we got a pretty high level of experience today. I know, you know, us three probably add up for one good guy, <laughs> Judd and Dan. And then these are kind of high ceilings, and we're using 5H rock. It's very heavy. So you put this sheet on this lift. Ready, we'll Judd? tip it down yeah. flat like this. Judster cranks it up. We raise it right up to the top of the lid, smash the sheet up against the lid. It's a heck of a lot easier than trying to hold it up there by hand. hand. Tell you what, the lift's the only way to do it. It saves the back. Right there, sock. Saves the body, saves the mind. Go ahead me that, that drill, Judd. Mind? My way now. You adjust it where you want it, and then you just screw it in. It's a great tool. Right here, this is the uh, breaker, the clutch. So I'll put a little pressure on it, lift that up, see that? And then you lower it. We just crank her down. If you want to stop, you do that, see that? Now we'll wheel her back, get it out of the way of the boys, and then I'll uh, we'll tilt the bed, and then I'll lower it a little more. And we'll be ready for the next one. Hip. You can take two befores and put a T on top of it. All you gotta do is get that sheet up there. I uh, usually have a couple guys screwing and uh, attaching it, doing the measuring, and then you have a guy cutting. So a three man group works pretty well. See, Judd's our cut man today. Dan and I are doing all the uh, fastening. So the old guy, we want to keep him on the ground. Yeah, it's, well, it's real important too. It's just tech, it's more technical. Right. A sharp knife, an extra long blade on it. Use a four foot square. I'll put my foot down on the bottom to hold it from moving. Take, score it, and then you snap it. And then you just have to break a little bit of the paper on there. If it's nice dry rock like that, it'll snap right off. We're actually using 5 8 4 by 12 They're gypsum panels. They're set up for veneer plaster. They're a different color, a little different screw pattern. Just make sure that the screws are, are nice and flush, not recessed, uh, no dimpling. Five eighths on the lid, half inch on the walls, all four by twelves, all heavy, all awkward. And, and by the time we get done, we're all going to be tired. In this situation where we have almost uh, a nine foot four ceiling in the front parlor and back parlor, we're uh, able to put a piece all the way around the floor and then put a piece on the top. And just as far as ease of fitting or working at the middle, you know, you put the piece in the middle. So if you're taping, you can tape the joints right there. This is a really fun project to work on because you come down here and it just seems like everybody that's here really wants to be here. And the more hands the better and there's usually a lot of people around. So things happen quickly and you really see the progress come along. Oh, we're doing pretty well. For the most part, I think uh, we're going to accomplish what we came here to do today and uh, get uh, the majority of the drywall hung and be a few odds and ends where we got to do some miscellaneous shimming, but uh, I think we're going to get it done. It feels great. You know, I was here to help take the, to do the demolition and now to see it coming back into to life, it, it's great and, and I can't wait till we get it all back to the original state. I would guess that we probably had uh, 60 sheets. Uh, with a combination of the five eighths and the half inch. We have a little bit left over, but uh, better too many than not enough. It's amazing what uh, the backer board does, and it'll even take another transformation after the plaster is finished. 
this morning. We could look from one end of the house to the other and see right through the walls because everything was open. Uh, but now everything's closed off with the drywall and uh, you can see the shape of the rooms. So that's very exciting. And we're looking forward to getting the plaster up. You know, what's really nice is that it's really going well. I was afraid it would be two or three days. We're talking one day, here, done, gone, finished, swept scrapped i think that we're happy i'm happy uh i'm kind of happy <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever tried it you know that putting on plaster is kind of an art form especially if you're trying to get a smooth surface like we're going for here so we've got the pros in rod tim and brad jenkins along with dave langan to get that going and there's a guy here from the company that makes the materials they're working with, Kevin Moyer, so we'll be getting insight from him as we go along. It's a two to three day process, but they've got three rooms done already and a couple rooms set up to show all the steps they go through. We've seen a, uh, a rebirth in the use of veneer plaster systems in residential applications. It's kind of exciting to see this trade that has been around for, for hundreds of years begin to take off and for a two coat system you have a base coat that is applied first. The base coat material is a gypsum based setting type compound with aggregate in it. The purpose of the base coat is to provide a substrate and straighten out any issues you might have and when it sets on the wall it provides a very durable surface ready to receive the final finish. On this job, Dave is the mix man, mixing the dry material with just the right amount of water to get the perfect consistency. Once they get going, he's pretty much constantly mixing till the whole room is done. With the base coat, we recommend five to seven quarts of water per 50 pound bag, but really most applicators aren't measuring the water. They make it to a specific consistency, something like a uh, stiff custard ice cream. Everything gets covered with this base coat, usually starting with the ceiling and then working their way down the walls. When they're done, they want it just under an eighth of an inch thick, so it'll cover all the mesh tape, the fasteners, and every square inch of the panels. Rod, it's happening so fast. Um, show me how you, exactly you get it on the wall. Okay, what I like to do is just get some out of my trowel and evenly coat the tape first. Then we go over the whole wall. As you get it on the wall here, what about overworking it? Well, you don't want to get it too tight. You want to just lay it on and move on. You make it look easy. <laughs> We're going to let you try it. I'm Are going to put some mud on the hawk. I don't know. I might screw it up. To get really good, it takes a few years. How long have you been doing it? 28 years. That's a few years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's harder than it looks. I think I need a little more than a few minutes to get the hang of this. <laughs> Not bad. She's doing a good job. The plasters need to understand the setting time of these materials and okay. make sure that they uh, start in a room, work around to inside corners and be complete so when the material's set they're done with that section. Well they wrap up the base coat here and get ready to do the finished coat in the other room. Let's just kind of wrap up some of these layout issues. Now again, we know what happened to the three rooms up front. We know we're going to be keeping this bedroom back here, but this kitchen area is a, a little murky. One thing we do know, this used to be the original entrance to the kitchen, so that door stays. This, we're quite certain, used to be a window. So we're going to haul out this door and turn that back into a window, as well as this also used to be a window. But because this is the only operating bathroom in the place, we're going we're to go ahead and keep that one. Originally, we tore out this wall, but now that we know that uh, when this whole addition was built on the back here, they added that wall to provide an entrance down here to the basement but there's an old cistern down there under the kitchen with no top and a few tons of dirt filling it up. Now there's some talk of creating a display on how cisterns work but I'll tell you it'd be a lot of work cleaning it out. There's no budget for it. It never played a role in any of the books so the decision was made just to leave it as it is. And then the second floor is in kind of a holding pattern but what's kind of neat is behind this knee wall there's a little storage area and this is where they used to store Uncle Keith's trunk. Now Betsy's folks would pull that trunk out, slide it in front of this window, so then she could sit here and write her stories with, with a wonderful view. Not much of a, a view today, but uh, at least that's how the, the story goes. Now the plan is to eventually get this wallpapered up here, repaint the floor the way it was, but right now the steps are just a little too steep for public tours, but uh, this will be a really neat space at some point. Let's wrap up those plaster walls.
The finishing materials, just like the base coat materials, are gypsum base. That's the material that is causing it to set and harden. They have about a, an hour's worth of open time that they have to work with the materials. And uh, once they're set, you can achieve a true monolithic surface with, uh, with a smooth application. And the crew is doing a great job here. Brad over here is putting on a scratch coat of the finished material. He lays that on. Once he gets that pretty much put in place and he doubles back with the same stuff and just gets everything evened out real nice. Over here, Tim is working on spraying a little bit of water on the surface. That just helps bring the cream out in the gypsum. And then Rod's over here working on a spot here now where he's doing the finish work. And you call this what, burnishing? This is furnishing or hard trawling the final coat, making it feel like glass. And this is what will give it the really nice hard surface as well, right? Right. What would you say is the toughest part in the whole process of doing this? Probably um, getting all the blemishes out and trawling it hard. That's probably the hardest part about this whole thing. I suppose especially being up on the ceiling. Right. Working above your head all day. Okay, well, it's looking great. I'll let you keep at it. Thanks. Thank you. One of the great things about these finishes is once we're complete in typically less than 24 hours or in about 24 hours, it's ready for final decoration, prime, paint, or wallpaper. And I tell you, we're thrilled to be able to help with the Betsy House. It's a, it's a great project, and I'm sure they'd be really proud to, to live in this house again if they were here. And what's kind of fun is as the plaster guys all finish up here, we're starting to see some of the volunteers come back in to the house today to kind of ooh and ah over everything that's happening. I think there's going to be some kind of a little party. We're all very satisfied with the progress that we're making. It's going much faster than we expected. We've got wonderful volunteers that have helped us so much. Um, we're very pleased. We are getting close. The end is in sight. You can almost visualize what Betsy's house looked like at the turn of the century. Well, it really looks great now compared to what it did two years ago or a year and a half ago, whenever it was when we started, where the ceiling plaster was falling down or cracked, and this room that we're in now had tile on the ceilings, and uh, it was sagging, and parts of the plaster on the walls were falling apart, so it's really looking great now with this new finishing coat on it that's on there. You would never think that it would all come together so quickly and so smooth, but when you have a lot of professionals around and... Uh, they can, they can make it seem like it's a cakewalk. Well, I would say we're, we're done with a lot of the bad phases here. The demo sheet rocking is a dirty phase. Uh, the insulation went well. There's a lot of uh, baseboard to put on here, a lot of window and uh, door trim to put on, but uh, I would say we're 60% along. It's just been so much fun having the gang down. and I'm in charge of the chuck wagon, and uh, the guys love to eat, and we're just going to keep feeding the earth until <laughs> we get this all done. For Mankato and the Midwest, we have saved a, a very special institution. It's not just a home of the early 1900s, but the home of Maud Hart Lovelace, and that's what makes it so special. It's great, the help we've had from you people been a great experience and it's really nice coming in here today and seeing the progress. The most important thing in preserving these older homes is to be able to save a part of history for future generations, our grandkids and our great grandkids, so that they can understand what life was like uh, back in the old days and uh, these houses really tell that story. It kind of feels like a blank slate now we can actually really put the finishing touches on these walls and the windows and the doors and, and, and really start to bring it back to life. And we definitely want to stick this project out to the end to see what it looks like all trimmed out appearing just like it did back in 1900. For all the craftspeople, the volunteers and the home time gang, I'm Miriam Johnson. And I'm Dean Johnson. Thanks for watching. Visit home time at PBS online. We've got more details about our projects, tips on owning and maintaining a home, and a great glossary of building terms. Stop by and see us at pbs.org. No matter what the dream, GMC is proud to support home time in making it come true. GMC, we are professional grade. When banks compete for your home equity loan, some offers really shine. You can compare up to four customized offers at LendingTree and choose the one that's right for you. 
1-800-555-TREE. When banks compete, you win. LendingTree.com. And by Johns Manville, manufacturers of a complete line of formation.